All right, everyone. So if you're following along in your book, we're now in chapter 20, which focuses on the idea of phylogeny. And this really has to do with organizing uh, organisms based on their physical characteristics and how they are related evolutionarily speaking, and then coming up with ways in which to create graphics to represent this. So <clears throat> if we're going holistically, systematics is the idea of classifying organisms to determine their relationships. And so we talked previously about um, Carlos Linnaeus, who was the founder of taxonomy, and he really looked at physical traits and morphology and tried to organize organisms based on those similar traits. And that's why we have um, binomial nomenclature and the naming of different species and so on. The idea of phylogenetics is looking at evolutionary history and really plotting out the um, organisms as they have evolved over time. So this is a pretty complicated thing. Like this chart here kind of covers all the different ideas in which we get information. So <clears throat> biological diversity is one area and taxonomy, like I said, is when we name different things. This column right here, it has to do with the overall taxonomy, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Most scientific names are the genus and the species. Whereas phylogeny has to do with cladistics, making cladograms, um, looking at homologous features and fossils and how they look in their molecular um, DNA and then arranging them in such a way. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, here is the taxonomy piece that was developed by Carlos Linnaeus. Um, and how we kind of arrive. And I know that they don't really teach this anymore, but that's just where it comes from. Our overall tree of life, FYI, has three domains. So um, overarching kingdoms, we have bacteria, eubacteria, or excuse me, eukarya, and archaea. So in terms of us eukaryotes, we are all up here in this orange category. And then there's bacteria and archaea. Archaea are kind of the crazy bacteria that live in super extreme environments. Um, and then the bacteria are really the prokaryotes and so on. So Linnaeus ranked based on what they looked like and kind of gave them zip codes, so to speak. And it does not necessarily reflect evolutionary relationships. Remember, we learned about convergent evolution where organisms could look very similar but not because of evolution. Okay, so what do we do to actually determine these evolutionary relationships? Like I mentioned, we look at fossils, and we look at morphology, like homo homologous structures, and we look at DNA evidence. So according to this particular picture, who is more related? Animals, which is us, and fungi are more related then either are to a plant. So you can see kind of time in this case would go from left to right, and we'll do more practice with this. But our branch point is right here, which is kind of more recent in time than our branch point with a plant, which is way back here. So putting one of these together is called a phylogenetic tree. It's a branching diagram that shows the evolutionary relationships over time. So Sometimes they match what might have been reflected in taxonomy, but not always. Again, convergent structures kind of mess with it. <clears throat> so order, we have carnivora, and we have all different kinds. So we have the cats that came down this way, and then we have the dogs that came down this way, and then I guess these would be considered like muskrats. Uh, <clears throat> and so on. So you can see how all of these are carnivores and then they broke down and the taxonomy has to go across the top. So phylogeny in general is the record over time of how organisms have speciated, meaning how we got new species over time. So there's some kind of common ancestor and then eventually the two populations became different enough to not be the same species anymore. And that is due to something we'll talk about later called reproductive isolation. 
meaning they can no longer reproduce with one another. And that's really the definitive point that says they are no longer one species. And this can happen via geography or behavior or time. So there are different types of barriers that can lead to this. But as soon as two groups of organisms can no longer breed with one another, they are considered different species. Natural selection works on new traits um, due to reproductive isolation. And so the idea is that no longer interbreeding and that they come from a common ancestor. So all living things have a common ancestor if we go back far enough. All right, so the idea here is that a cladogram is a diagram that depicts that branching pattern. It's kind of the easiest thing. A clod or a clade, however you want to say it, I say clod, I think, is a group of species that includes an ancestral species and all of its descendants. Shared derived characteristics are labeled here along the main branch. So those are characteristics that are shared between those organisms and all the ones that come after it. And I'll kind of go through what that looks like in a minute. So here's an example of a color-coded picture. On a cladogram, time is always going from bottom to top. So oldest is down at the bottom and it represents like this bottom, what's called a node, is where there is a branching off point or some kind of speciation event. And usually I would say it's at the branch point, so it's not the best drawn here, but it would be where there's a branch point. That's a common ancestor to everything that comes after it in time. So for example, this blue node here is the common ancestor to everything above it, not below. This is a common ancestor um, this middle blue dot, to everything that comes above it in time, not below. So that's what we call um, a common ancestor. Um, the common ancestor to everything would be down here at the very, very, very bottom. At the top, that's where you're going to find the current organisms. So these are organisms that are currently alive, that have branched off at some point in time. Here we also have derived traits. These are going to be found along the main branch, and those are the traits that are accumulated over time that develop and make things different than they were before. So, all right, here's an example. A clod could be the blue, so C and D, or it could be like the pink, B, C, and D. All the evolutionary descendants of a common ancestor. So if this pink right here is our common ancestor, then that and everything after would be an example of a clod. In blue, we have a sister species, two species that are each other's closest relative. So this branch point right here, where I'm circling, is the common ancestor between C and D. And on this particular chart, C and D are the most related to each other compared to anything else. C and D are equally different than anything that came before because they branched off at the same point in time. So C is equally related to B and A as D is to B and A. And you can rotate these around because these are equally related. I could switch them and it means the exact same thing. So I could rotate C and D and have it mean the exact same thing because they have the same common ancestor and they branched off at the same point in time. So don't just necessarily read across the top, you kind of have to look at the branches. And there are multiple ways then to represent this information. Okay, so conclusions. This is one example. Another term to think about too is that I want to mention is called an outgroup. An outgroup doesn't share the traits that have evolved. So the outgroup is the one that's kind of usually the oldest or for whatever reason doesn't have the trait that we're talking about. So a lamprey in this example is our outgroup. It doesn't have any of these traits that are written here in pink. The pink are the derived characteristics over time. And you can see that jaws, 
This would mean that lamprey do not have jaws because they branched off before jaws came about. And then if you're moving up time, perch then branched off. And then if you're continuing over time, lungs. So this implies that perch have jaws, but they do not have lungs. And then salamanders have jaws and lungs, but they don't have any of these traits that came after. All of the traits don't necessarily have to come on the main branch. Another example is here. So we have jaws, lungs, and claws. And then we have this branch point. Fur develops this way. And then we have a mouse and a chimp. So both a mouse and a chimp have fur. But over here, we have scales. So lizards have scales. But then there was this branch point of something called a gizzard and a crocodile and then a pigeon, which has feathers. So for example, on this cladogram, pigeons have feathers, nothing else does. Crocodiles and pigeons have gizzards, nothing else does. Lizards, crocodiles, and pigeons all have scales, but nothing else does. So you can have traits on this also as well. Um, lizard and chimp are equally related to perch. So if you're going backwards in time, here where I'm circling is the common ancestor between a lizard and a chimp. If I'm going back down, here's where that common ancestor would be for a perch, a lizard, and a chimp. It's in that same spot. So anything that really comes after it are all equally related to a perch. Lamprey is the outgroup. It doesn't have any specific traits. And pigeons and crocodiles would be six sister taxa. They are the most closely related. I would also argue that mouse and chimp our six sister taxa. Whew. All right. So no assumptions to be made about how much divergence has occurred. Um, you have to look at common ancestors. Trees are hypotheses. We don't necessarily know 100% that all these are accurate. We are looking at the derived characteristics and to give us an idea, but that doesn't 100% confirm everything. It helps us determine relative ages of species, it helps us determine common ancestors, and it helps us determine patterns of descent. But it does not tell us the actual age of a species, only relative, and it cannot tell us the exact number of genetic changes that have occurred. That's what you would need to do genetic analysis for. This is another way to represent information, so you might see it this way also. In terms of cladograms, we looked at those already. This is called a phylogram. And this is organized in such a way that the line length does indicate some amount of time. So you, it means pretty much the same thing, except instead of from going from bottom to top, you read it from left to right, where the leftmost is the oldest and the rightmost is current. And the length of the branch, as I mentioned, gives you an indication for how long a certain organism existed and that these branch points, these nodes, are where there was a speciation event. They branched off and went different places. F in this example would be an outgroup because it doesn't have any of the other traits that these have. And then a clod, as I mentioned, a single common ancestor. So A and B could be sister taxa. They have a common ancestor here at this blue node. They also have a common ancestor back here that they share with C, D, and E. This slide gives you a good general picture of what that looks like. Um, so if it helps to look at these, then please do. All right, here's another example of how you could put them all together. Um, and it's really just vocabulary, but it's fine. So monophyllin Phyletic shows the common ancestors of all of their descendants. So in group one here, that would be a monophyletic group. In part B, it shows recent common ancestor, but not all of the descendants because it's leaving out G here. So therefore, that would be a para, para means side, para phyletic group. Poly means that you're including a recent common ancestor not included. So like D is not a part of the ancestry of a, B, C. So therefore, it's called something else. Most of the time, we're going to look at something like A, which is a clod. 
All right, so how do I construct something like this? Well, this, I believe, is the exact same slide I use for freshman biology, but it has specific traits. So the traits that you would have are lined up along the left, and if there's a zero, that means that it's lacking or it doesn't have it. If it has a one, then that means it is present. So a lancet does not have any of these particular traits, which means that in the grand scheme of time, in this case, I'm making um, a phylogram or a phylogenetic tree, it branches out first. It doesn't have any of the specific traits. And then we have a vertebral column, which everything else has. So I can kind of branch that here, and then everything else that comes after it has it. And then hinge jaws, walking legs, amnion, and hair. Only the leopard has hair compared to oop, anything else. We look at morphological data to help us with this to kind of catalog those different traits. So that's where morphological diverge divergence comes into play. The idea is that if they look similar, then perhaps they have a common ancestor. But remember, that's not always true because sometimes that can pose a problem when we have analogous structures from convergent evolution. So like a bat wing and a bird wing and an insect wing all come from very, very different or excuse me, I should say, a bird wing and a bat wing are homologous. They have similar features, similar bone structure, a result of evolution. But then there's an insect wing. An insect wing doesn't even have any bones. So that would be an example of convergent evolution. It's an analogous structure. It provides the same function that a bird wing and a bat wing does, but it's not a result of evolution. It's more a result of the environment that these organisms were in. So it's tricky then when you're trying to put them in a tree because you can't just use wings, perhaps, to mark where they are. So other things that we would then look at would be fossil evidence, other similarities, the complexity of the trait, genetics, and so on to really determine if something is homologous or analogous. Okay, so enter DNA. DNA is the same in terms of, you know, the universal code of life. But the idea is if organisms are more similar to each other, then they should have more DNA in common. So they oftentimes sequence organisms and then overlay their DNA next to each other to figure out how much is similar and how much is different. And based on that, you can get an idea of how related something is. So like here's an example where they have sequences, um, some random things might have happened to two different organisms, and you can kind of see where they're similar, and then there's areas where they're different. So there's an analysis software on the computer that kind of lines all this stuff up for us and then can give you that information. So here's an example of how that is lined up. There are certain things that are conserved, so apparently having a T at spot one is super important. Having a C at spot four, super important. But then some organisms have different lettering. Um, and so then that can yield looking at how closely some things are related to one another. Here's another example. The more differences, the less related you are. So I believe this is cytochrome C, perhaps. Um, that's usually a good one to look at. And then you can get an idea of relatedness. So here's an example. Um, human compared to a human is no different. A uh, mushroom compared to a mushroom is no different and tulip compared to a tulip. But a human and a mushroom are 30% different, whereas a human and a tulip are 40% different. So you can kind of use that to come up with a couple of possibilities. Well, if a human and a mushroom are approximately 30% different, well, then you can construct something like this. Or you could construct something like this. A human and a tulip are 40%. So we are less related to a tulip than we are to a mushroom. Um, this goes along with the idea of mutations are occurring at kind of a constant rate. Again, they happen by chance, and it can be used to kind of measure time. So we expect that the number of nucleotide changes to be proportional to the amount of time that has happened. So this is kind of happening at a normal rate, so therefore 
the more that you have between two species kind of shows the more evolution time that has occurred. So that's why we're able to kind of make that comparison. All right, but there's other things. Something called horizontal gene transfer can mess with that specific clock. So genes can be transferred between different organisms. Bacteria are the easiest thing to think about. So remember when we did transformation and plasmids and bacteria swapping genetic material to become resistant. So there are things called transposable elements, plasmids, viruses can carry genetic material from one to another. Um, organisms fuse with other organisms. Um, all of those things kind of help with the rapid evolution. So when we think about um, DNA changing over time and the fact that it can be constant, sometimes it can happen really, really quickly in instances like this. All right, so when making trees, we have something called the rule of parsimony. Simplest explanation is the best. It's kind of like Occam's razor. When presented with multiple examples, usually the simplest, easiest one is the right one. So whenever we're drawing these things, we usually pick the one that requires the fewest craziness to happen, or the littlest amount of genetic changes to occur. And as I mentioned, the length of the tree oftentimes has an indication for time, which therefore represents genetic changes. More time equals more genetic change. So here's an example of when time is kind of put with it. So a human is related to a fly, for example, Drosophila, if we go far enough back in time, which would be 542 million years ago. Um, then we diverged from a lancelet roughly around that same time. Um, Cenozoic is our current era, which means that a human and a mouse on this particular phylogram are the most closely related, but we branched apart. Our common ancestor existed 65 million years ago, um, which coincidentally is <clears throat> when the dinosaurs went extinct. All right. So I, I just want to tell you here on this last slide that there are different ways to do it. So we learned about cladograms and we learned about phylogenetic trees, but there's all kinds of craziness that can occur. So just please be able to anticipate multiple different ways of the data being represented, but yet it all really means the same thing. And you'll do some more practice with this where it's presented in different ways. Look for the nodes, look for the branch points, look for the common ancestors in whatever situation, and that will help guide you to determine relationships.